Jennifer on Facebook. And I am Sandy Yanone. I'm the, your poetry grand marshal for today. It is quite a pleasure to be with you. And I want to just give a shout out to our first hour of readers. What a spectacular, spectacular way to start the parade. And how beautiful to end with music and poetry together. Uh, I am the author of Both for Women from Salmon Poetry. Uh, it is my extreme pleasure to be with you on the 50th anniversary of the very first Pride Parade on June 28th, 1970, which was in commemoration of the Stonewall Riots, which began on June 28th, 1969. We're here gathered today um, to commemorate and celebrate the 50th anniversary of Pride and also in solidarity with the Black Lives Matter movement and the um, recent historic US Supreme Court decision extending employment rights for LGBTQ folks um, in the United States. Uh, we have an incredible lineup to follow the fabulous paraders we had in the first hour. A few bits of parade uh, etiquette and news here. Uh, we're all in Zoom land and you all are in Facebook um, watching us. We are so grateful for you to be with us. All the bios of our readers are available to you in the Cultivating Voices Live open mic chat room um, on our group page. Also, we have donation um, organizations um, that we hope that you will consider making a donation to nine spectacular organizations doing great intersectional work um, all across the United States and the UK and Ireland. And we'll be making a donation in, uh, on our readers' behalfs as well today. I wanna give a big shout out to our co-sponsor, Headmistress Press. I also want to thank Don Krieger and Elizabeth Ann for helping with the Zoom tech support and Without further ado, let me please introduce our readers for hour two of our Poetry Pride Parade. We begin with Tara Hardy, who is the working class, queer, femme, disabled poet and founder of Bent's Writing Institute for LGBTQ plus people in Seattle. She's a daughter of a United Auto Workers and has worked in social justice movements most of her life. I can vouch for her. Uh, <laughs> currently, she teaches for University Beyond Bars, Hugo House, and the Evergreen State College. Tara is the author of two books by Right Bloody Publishing, Bring Down the Chandeliers, and her second book, My, 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 which won a Washington State Book Award. Next, we have Lex Lenga Torres, a spoken word poet of extraordinary, extraordinary power coming to us live. And I have the wrong bio in front of me. So go to the bio to read the rest of Lex's bio. My apologies, Lex. Third is Orla Fay, and Orla joins us today from County Meath. She is the editor of Boyne Berries. Recently, her work has appeared in Tales from the Forest, Impossible Archetype, Cranog, and The Lake. She won third place in the Oliver Goldsmith Poetry Competition 2019 and was highly commended in the Jonathan Swift Creative Writing Award. 2019 and the Francis Ledgwood Poetry Award 2019. Her poem, The Natural Order, appeared in the Irish Times as a poem of the week in July 2019. What a year for you, Orla. Well deserved. Her debut collection is forthcoming from Salmon Poetry. Next is Cardwin 
Kerdwin writes from the perspective of a queer, disabled, mixed race immigrant offspring. Their disability has made them an expert at writing in bed. Wherever possible, they're at the beach watching eagles, crows, and purple martins. In 2019, they camped three weeks in the desert of a rented cargo van. Their dream is to purchase a wheelchair van with a bed so they can write outdoors. Donate to support that dream. Check out the bios. And finally, to close out our second hour, we have Charlie Dale, who is a tree lover, an avid baker, and a writing center tutor and student at the Evergreen State College in Olympia, Washington. Thanks all for being here. Enjoy hour two of our parade. And without further ado, my dear friend and sister, Tara Hardy. Hi everyone, happy pride. Thank you to Sandy and Beth and Don for all the free labor you've given us to make this possible. Um, what a great first hour. I cannot wait to hear the rest of the parade. Um, I'm going to read four poems today. Uh, the first one I wrote, I want you to know that um, I do not have the answers. I do not need or want congratulations or thank you for writing this. And I wrote this piece as a call out to myself as much as anyone else. It's called Buses Stop. And it starts with an epigraph. One could argue that white women are the most protected demographic in America as they benefit from white patriarchy in a unique manner, Dr. T. Hassan Johnson. Buses, stop for me. At the airport, without asking, I am pre-checked pre through security. I've never been warned or questioned about the risk of addiction when prescribed painkillers. Cops turn their backs to me. Landlords accept my bad credit. No one jumps when I get out of my car on my own street in front of my apartment or anywhere else. I am late frequently without worry. Hair products know my name. No one asks me to empty the trash. People are surprised that I've been a maid, that my brother is in prison. No one is surprised that my parents are still married or that I've been to Europe. My recovery from addiction <clears throat> my recovery from addiction is a triumph, not a clucked tongue. If I say I saw it, I saw it. If I say I saw it, I saw it. Elevators are held, wait staff react, doors open, arms help me with bags, change my oil, give me cookies and trophies and discounts and microphones and healthcare and preventative healthcare and diplomas and the word pretty and the word lovely and the word delicate and the pedestal. I am innocent, I am innocent. Everywhere I go, I get admission, 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 admission. But if that woman of color on the panel gets more speaking time than me, it's unfair, isn't it? People take my number and remember my name know how to spell it and it pre-speaks me on a resume. At the hospital, I am given care and free medicine even when I don't have insurance. So I take it. Take, 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 accept, 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 accept an ocean's worth, a middle passage's worth of unearned privilege with my bright, bright bones and my pink, pink smile. Those yarn hats, they reflect me, as does every mirror I pass, in which I recognize myself. I'm so friendly, I can afford to be. I seem happy, unencumbered. I seem accessible, don't need to be hard. No one is surprised that I've been to college. No one says, I didn't mean it like that. Or you make everything about one issue or just ignore my friends, they don't really mean it. Pantyhose and band-aids and lipstick and base and aced bandages and magazines and movies and Hallmark cards and cake toppers and billboards and history match me. So do catcalls. Yes, even catcalls or what they're missing. To my kind, invisible is my access and the unearned mountain of acquisitions I stand atop. Unless you are standing at the bottom of the mountain, looking up at the enviable texture of my hair as it blows in the updraft of the expectations of me, who cares if the escalator is rising? I walked on it, didn't I? I mean, I didn't just stand there. So it's okay if I feel a little, what's the word? entitled to timely service. It's okay if when the flight is late, like really late, like miss the holiday late, that I become irate. Why did the plane leave without me? Why don't you carry my shampoo? Aren't there any tables left? Where's my order? You don't have soy milk? I called an hour ago. You forgot my soda? 
it is so annoying to sit in my air conditioned car in traffic. Shit, I got a parking ticket. Oh, my brake lights out. Thank you, officer. I was fuck a speeding ticket. My children can jaywalk without being shot. My children can steal candy without being shot. My children can own phones and be children. My children can climb trees and refuse to come down, can wield knives and even guns and steal cars and go berserk and go crazy and rob people and stores in the planet. My children can speed and walk and sleep and dream and ride the bus and hang out on sidewalks and loiter and browse the aisles and order Starbucks and make out in cars and be fat on airlines and be weird and wear rags and badass coats and low hats. I can see it. I mean, I know what you're talking about. So why do I have to go to the anti-racism training? I've read The Color Purple. I know it's hard, but what do you want me to do? I mean, just tell me again, because I hate what you have to go through. But with all that's going on, I feel so, what's the word? Powerless. What I want to say about that is that, thank you everyone, I feel weird receiving any kind of clapping for um, a poem that's about a privilege that protects me every minute of my life, including when I'm sleeping. Um, and uh, we all know that white folks need to do better because our silence um, and our comfort causes um, costs people of color their lives. And so I want to um, briefly suggest that uh, we all use the great tool of Google. Um, and uh, Google, one of the things we can look up is 97 things that white people can do. Um, a great list of action because it's our, our words are nothing without action behind them. Okay, I would like to read a poem now. One of the things you can't see about me, but uh, if, we were, if we were in person, you would understand that I have a disability. And um, I wrote this next poem while trying to navigate an institution that is new to me um, in terms of navigating it in terms of access. It is called Body Encounters Barrier or Stairs, Not a Metaphor. It's for CJ Rosenquist. In the current secretly intentional house, there is cope with condition itself, cannot be underestimated. There is barrier. There is encountering barrier. There is struggle to negotiate barrier while being watched. There is kindly meant offer to help, almost always appreciated. There is kindly meant but no asking first help that often involves non-consensual touch. There is hyper visibility of body and invisibility of personhood, a neat paradox conjured by inaccessibility. There is don't observably feel anything about any piece in public, which equals choke down snake of shame, muscle grown in the jungle of unintentionality. There is during all, cheerfully, patiently, what is apparently unfruitfully educate while performing ability in public. Go 10 clicks, repeat. But when the roof, walls, windows, when the floor, floorboards, foundation, when the cup of land that holds the house is love, is welcome, when the nakedly intentional shelter is access for body, disability, and or black, brown, trans, non-binary, queer, Muslim, fat, elder, child, carbon-based and breathing, valued simply for being and never demand for government document, there is no barrier, no encounter of it, no being watched, only aid, consent, no shame, never blame. Visibility right-sized equals neighbor, not snake. Repeat of this life is clean skate on frozen lake. Imagine the beloved who needs assistance vacuuming saliva from her mouth, always has a willing hand holding hose and back up heart whose intention is set on weatherproof interdependence. This is the house, the land, the world of access, of welcome, of here, you belong here. Briefly, I wanna say that um, for those of us with disabilities, it has created a bit of a whiplash to see how quickly the able-bodied world can create access when we are all given stay-at-home orders. Um, uh, I really want to say that I hope that able-bodied folks will not leave us behind again uh, when the world reopens. Um, however, I pretty much know it will happen and I'm already uh, emotionally preparing myself. However, um, for able-bodied folks who want to be allies, I'm going to suggest um, getting, uh, perhaps creating an app where, well, let me say this. 
in the nine years before um, all this Zoom access happened for um, during COVID, the number of times that friends of mine offered to hold up phones at, at events so that I could at least participate remotely was exactly zero. Um, and it's amazing to me how quickly it can happen. And um, why don't we create an app that uh, where people can line up to hold up their phones at events so those of us who are stuck at home can attend concerts and poetry readings and parties and all those kinds of things. So, um, yeah. Not sure that was the most organized or articulate, but I have a lot of feelings about it. Okay, the next poem, I wanted to write about being a non-binary femme, but I didn't finish it in time. Um, this piece is about gender. I want to remind us to not equate um, body features such as genitalia or chromosomes or anything else with gender, and to remind us all that we owe our liberation today on the anniversary of Stonewall to trans women of color. Um, this is called What the Doe Feels. What must the doe feel with that target on her lover's skull? What much of her body must she want to throw in front of bullet? A prize she must think he is yes, a prize. But leave him be. Leave him to wild up the forest as nature intended. Don't make me a widow. Don't make our children's future a window from which they will never be able to wipe the grief. When you say you're going to wear a tie on the plane, my torso blushes with heat, with a built-in lean towards masculinity. Straight women understand this lean towards, this nature-installed flush for the ways of swagger. But what they may not have had to develop so keenly is my nose for gunpowder, the way fear lives right next door to my desire. I know you can handle yourself on the plane and in any public restroom between there and here. But there are days I wish I could stitch myself to your hip. Send me in to play around in your stead. Find the rifle first. Meet it with my nose. Plead with Hunter with my breast. Take me. Take me. Leave my buck alone. Unstoppable nature. Thank you, everyone. Happy Pride. Happy Pride, Tara. Wow, thank you so much, Tara. Um, hey, everybody. Um, my name's Lex. I use all pronouns, um, just not it. Um, and I'm going to be reading three poems. Um, the first one is called An Exchange, and I wrote this poem after my fourth year uh, attending a predominantly white college as a person of color and just uh, feeling a lot of overwhelm with in an institution that claims uh, so much that they strive towards diversity and equity um, versus what is actually being felt. Okay. An Exchange. While I was focusing on trying to remain grounded in the classroom of prove yourself, I was promptly sat on by the white elephant in the room, helping me maybe a little too much in my original goal. I found myself kissing the footprint of a settler's boot. My spine began crackling along in discord with the splintering of the hardwood floor. It was there I found under the floorboards ground. And barely buried in the polluted dirt, a realization that my body in this room is a diversity scam, a corporate strategy, a noble savage, a mild mannered, melanated scholar. And it better stay that way or who knows what terrifying mouse might cause the pachyderm to catapult off my back out of fear this act becoming a final force to pop my lungs. I don't need the recallability of the animal currently crushing me to remember how this reality got half ass hidden into the foundations of these institutions. I'm suffocated by this shit every day. After all, this Dumbo is a gift from the monarchs of respectability and good standing for providing such vital insight to the institution. Whether it was the weight of this realization or the ivory beast on my back, 
My voice began to rumble from the depths, crawling its way to demand assistance, but on its way towards the light, the white burden's trunk raised to the bleaching lights and trumpeted a sort of shh, white noise. As I squeaked my prayer, I reassessed my situation and decided I need to preserve my breath before it is crushed out of this body. Thank you. Um, this next one is a new poem, really, really new poem, um, called Dandelion. Too many times, too often, I have mistaken my roots for wings. When knots tugged tight with tension, tucked deep beneath my hidden plane of petal flesh, Percolating heat emanating from every twisted tendon rattles out two protruding tiny growths of what I wish to be wings. Yearning dormant limbs burst into an unending stretch, taking all the breath I had left, they extend to their fate. Without daring a glance behind my shoulder to witness this birth, I foolishly assume as an escape, I prepare for takeoff. With crouched knees, wounded hips, a strained breath and heavy hope. I reel up towards the trajectory of where I assume the unseen fate awaits. A weightless, airy, empty, thrashing, false flight. A feathered, tethered freedom. The veins that sprout from my spine firmly clutch to the ground and snap my body back to earth. A familiar confusion echoes out from the halting crash and settles in the aches between bark and bone. Clouded eyes, finally heavy enough to rain, whisper sincere questions and soft pleas. A sticky reply oozes from the wrinkled roots. Sap, tears, blood, Grief is the milk that runs through our stem. Splaying my fingers to embrace the sore longing soil, I realize that my freedom is not in a futile flight, but in the cracking, wet, slimy, searing, tearing, tearing screams of growing pains. Too many times, too often, I forget how our roots began with wings on our seeds. Thank you. Um, and then my last poem is a bit shorter and it's called Housework. Um, I just want, no, I'm going to allow myself to need someone to understand I will never wash our dishes. I will joyfully claim any other chore or burden. I'll pump our clothes in a tub, iron them with the warmth we generate. I'll gather our collective trash, sort the filth from what, we can be, what can be made new. I'll sterilize each centimeter of the bathroom, let no damn spot survive. I'll check the vents for cockroaches, chew out the lingering rats in the attic. I'll ax the wood and stack the logs, save them for the cold shouldered nights. I'll mop the bucket from the tiles, soak up the shit we track inside. I'll relocate the weeds that choke our garden. I promise the roots support our lungs. These are my vows and my promise to you. I'll take on all these duties. Just please, please never expect me to stand in front of the sink and anchor both hands in the suffocating suds to become lost, to spiral down the drain along with the crumbs we didn't have room to digest. Do not ask me to go there. Unless by the offhand chance that I ask to clean our dishes, say yes. Sit in the space between the sink and the toaster beside me so that I may find your eyes when I look up so that I can let the eyes on the back of my head sleep. 
Become the drain strainer when you see me start floating with the food and bubbles. Dry the drops I missed. Should these vows fit the portion of your plate and the oath not too much to stomach? When your knee and the floor decide to finally confess their love for each other, ask me, will you let me do the dishes for the rest of our lives? Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. This was so fun. I'm so excited to be here and listen to everybody. Lots of love. Hello guys, I hope you can all hear me. Thumbs up. Oh, great. Um, thank you, Lex, for that reading. That was lovely. And uh, my name is Orla and I'm from Ireland in County Mead and I edit a magazine called Wine Berries. And I'm going to read just four poems for you tonight. And the first one is called The Member of the Wedding. Um, which I'm sure you know, it's a Carson McCullers novel. And um, when we were teenagers back here, um, our teacher taught us this novel for our curriculum. So the member of the wedding. When I think of dog days, I remember Frankie Adams, F, Jasmine Adams, lost and struggling in the novel. I see her roaming the streets of the South, her hair slicked back and clothes clinging to her in sweat. She longs to go to Alaska. We studied Carson McCullers novel along with The Hobbit and To Kill a Mockingbird for our junior cert. I related to Frankie's awkwardness, the way she longed to fit in. I think our teacher was showing us that it was okay to be different, that feeling was something we could do. She told us to underline Atticus Finch's words to scout about walking around in someone else's skin to consider things from another's point of view. I had nothing to do on the summer holidays, so I read, bought the Lord of the Rings, trilogy in one huge volume, the Bible my brothers and I christened it. The cover was green, a majestic Gandalf portrayed holding his staff in the woods. We named the kittens that appeared from the hay barn, Frodo and Sam. At night we lit a campfire and trailed across the fields with a torch and makeshift wooden weapons. We stayed out for as long as we could until startled by distant barking or a frightened rustle or until the stars were too bright, too close, too silver. I was allowed to take the bus to O'Connell Street, arranged to meet friends under the clock at Easton's. I wore combat trousers, smoked a Marlboro, felt dizzy afterwards. <laughs> Thank you. And it's kind of difficult because you don't exactly know what people are saying or thinking here. But um, the second poem is John Keats' Ghosts. And it's, um, I imagine, a conversation with John Keats. John Keats' Ghost. I have an habitual feeling of my real life having passed and that I am leading a posthumous existence which was Keats's last letter to Charles Armitage Brown on the 30th of November, 1820. John Keats' ghosts came to me as I watched the sun set on the April day, unspooling itself in a glory of yellow. It was strange to see him, but he said that he remembered me from when I was 15, when I recited Ode to a Nightingale and those other poems in the anthology. Bright star, la belle dame, San merci, ode to a Grecian urn and on the sea. He had been looking over my shoulder when I wrote notes in pencil on the side of the page. Something about art being able to overcome the transience of life. 
he said he liked that because look at him now, a pale specter. While his poetry is still renowned, Keats resembled a black and white photograph, except he held a brimming purple glass of wine as he reclined against the windowsill. I told him that I thought that was sad because he died so young. He recounted his final year, the arterial blood of tuberculosis, the stormy journey across the Meds to Naples, the reaching of Rome too late, the warm weather being gone and his chance to live. I said to him when he had finished, John, I'm sorry, it was a cruel blow. I mean, you're only 25, right? But like you said, your work lives on. At that, he looked up and grinned. It was a lovely grin, wide and hopeful. He seemed to find some peace in himself and he turned his back to me and walked right out into the sky, into the last flares of the sun, tapering out like a black burnt piece of paper. I was glad to meet him, claimed the first silver star for us and wished that I always be haunted by beauty. Mm -hmm. um, so we're halfway there. Um, this poem, uh, I was out walking last summer and I heard this terrible crying and screeching. And then I realized that it was a uh, sparrow hawks and I thought, yeah, that's worthy of a poem. So I wrote this lines written between crying sparrow hawks. It's also kind of like a love letter to summer. Anyway, lines written between crying sparrow hawks. The power of summer, the length of her days, the bright bird song at dawn, the dusk to dawn, interlude, brief. Barely enough time to cross an ocean of sleep. Yet she passes, roses in her fragrant hair, may blossom strewn before her feet as she comes upon Canaan. She feeds the multitudes, raspberries, strawberries, coaxes the apple to quicken. Oh, her sunshine, her warmth, Iberian oranges and lemons. African winds. She's a colourful kite, majestic, an eagle, a girl building a sandcastle, a wave, a horse running to stand still. She's a lover, fair face, again rosebud kisses, a purple midnight to cling to, a mating call, a lover scorned, a masquerade at a ball. Romeo and Juliet at Eden's Fall. Thank you. So um, my last poem is called Say My Friend and I wrote this about 20 years ago when I was very young and it's kind of inspired by uh, Sting's uh, song Fields of Gold. Yeah. And I think I heard him sing it on Parkinson, sure, sure. which is a talk show in the UK. And really, really moved me. So it's my friend. Say my friend. Say my friend that memory is longer than this day, this full day of my life, that in the night as I sleep time away, I am not lost. Say my friend that I am the moon, when the sun has set in the western sky, that I am alive in your dreams and part of the tears that you cry. Say, my friend, that you believe in ghosts when shadows move across the earth, that somehow past and present will entwine in the steady beating heart. Say, my friend, that love is strong and true when beaten down by time, 
that when your lips are blue and cold, the warm kisses you remember will be mine. Say, my friend, that night and day cannot be parted long, that one day soon dawn will break and forever we will be one. Thank you. Hi everyone, I'm Cardwin. Uh, my pronouns are they, them, theirs. I live on a rural island in the Pacific Northwest US. I'm queer, genderqueer, disabled, mixed race, Asian, and a person of color. My mother's people were Welsh and Irish. My father's family immigrated from China to the US, fleeing government violence. I'm chronically ill, I live in I live from my bed in a power wheelchair. I am here today for the people who can't come to in-person poetry readings. I have not participated in a poetry reading in over a decade. For some of us, coming to an in-person event costs us weeks or months in bed to recover. For us, stay-at-home orders are an everyday experience. Imagine what it would be like for those orders to never be lifted. Events like this allow people like us to participate. I so appreciate being included. After the pandemic, when you go back to meeting and hugging in person, I hope you will remember us, those of us who live from bed, and find a way to include us. And thank you, Tara Hardy, for that shout out. And um, also, I just want to say I'm so honored to be here and to be um, in a lineup with Tara Hardy, who was um, my first poetry teacher and the person who got me on my first stage. I have one poem for you today, and it is dedicated to Black Lives Matter. Don't, don't tell me our country is broken. Underneath those words is the premise that it was ever whole. Did you forget? This country arose from the theft of indigenous lands, steeped in rape, soaked in the blood of genocide, built on the backs of another nation's stolen citizens who were bargained off like sacks of potatoes. Only sacks of potatoes are usually treated better. I remember a friend proudly telling me about her Norwegian forefather how he had built one of the major railways in this country. I listened to her silently, wondering if he had ever broken a sweat or a nail while slaves and Chinese immigrants who could have been my ancestors toiled under the lash of his overseer's whip after being separated from their wives so they couldn't pollute this country with children who looked like them. Don't tell me you are surprised the police are killing black and brown people. Is it news to you? Don't you know police arose from slave patrols and later thugs hired by rich white businessmen to forcibly keep the working class masses from rising up against their abuses? Now thugs are what young black men are called to justify their killings on the way home from buying Skittles and soda at the corner store. How far have we come since Emmett Till, since the church in Birmingham where four little girls got killed? How far since Rodney King? I'm asking you because I want to know how many times are we gonna do this? What would Martin say to us now? The beatings and killings are not new to black and brown people. Only now the images are coming to you. 
after centuries of lynchings that have gone unwitnessed, so many dead, unnamed to history, to history. Don't tell me you believe in the laws supposedly upheld by police. You know the laws don't apply to us equally. They were not written to contain the wealthy. The structure was built on the very idea to put the ones who don't matter, put black and brown bodies in jail. How else could they get cheap labor, labor after slavery was supposedly over? I know you are seeing the deaths and crying with us now. The whole world saw Ahmad Arbery gunned down in the street. Breonna Taylor, who died in her home after going to sleep. George Floyd crying and dying under the knee of police. Finally, the world can see. That's what I mean. This is what brutality looks like. The world is burning with the fire of our rage. Tell me, why do you care now to burn it all down? Don't tell me the world is broken. Instead, tell me what you will finally do to make it whole. Tell me what happens when the fires die out. Will you go back to your safe life, leaving the black and brown people to figure this out? Don't tell me you are shocked by people being knocked down, beaten, shot, suffocated by police, by the KKK, by immigration, by random racists on the street. But the killing was justified, the officer with the gun, the baton, the badge, and three armed friends was afraid for his life. After all, the unarmed man he killed was a criminal because he to stole a pack of cigars, because he was selling cigarettes. I mean, really, he must have been asking for it. He was wearing a hoodie. Shot dead because he went for a run shot dead while sleeping, dead because they were queer, because she was black and trans and wearing a dress, dead in a jail cell because she changed lanes, because she resisted being thrown to the ground, found dead in a cell after screaming for help, smashed against a wall because she must have been mentally ill, confused, suicidal, because she talked back, because he looked suspicious, because he was homeless, because he was wearing a hoodie, suffocated on the pavement because he resisted, shot dead because he was reaching for his license, shot dead because he ran from police, because he was developmentally disabled, because they were deemed illegal, because they crossed a border, because she was afraid to die in her country. She was shot dead holding a pair of scissors. She was a seven-year-old on the couch, set on fire, before being shot. He was shot 12 times with a taser. He was shot dead holding a cell phone, a wallet, a pocket knife, a scrap of wood, a screwdriver, a toy gun. When I turn out the lights, a procession of names marches through my head of those sentenced to death by hate. Emmett Till, John T. Williams, Sara Lee Circle Bear, Paul Castaway, Ayana Jones, Amadou Diallo, Trayvon Martin, Eric Garner, Michael Brown, Isel Ford, Tamir Rice, Benjamin Whiteshield, Walter Scott, Freddie Gray, Zachary Bearheels, Stonechild Chiefstick, Jason Harrison, Philando Castile, Jacqueline Call McKean, L'Oreal Sinjini, Sandra Bland, Charlena Lyles, Tanisha Anderson, Stefan Clark, Elijah McLean, Ahmad Arbery, Brianna Taylor, George Floyd, Rayshard Brooks, Remy Fells, Rhea Milton. Don't you see? I can't say them all or we'd be here for centuries. Please say their names with me. Say them with me so we don't ever forget. Don't tell me we can reform this. This is what oppression, repression, suppression, domination look like. We can't rebuild on a foundation of hate. Don't go back to where it's safe. Wait, are you still in doubt? Don't tell me it's broken. Tell me what you will do when it all shakes out. Will you stay in the streets to help us figure this out? What will you do when the fires die out? Thank you. Oh my God.
That was wonderful. I really enjoyed that. Thank you. I'm so glad that you could be with us. And it will not be the last time you will be with us, Caridwin. I hope it will not be the last time that you will be with us. Thank you so much, Caridwin. Hey, Charlie. Hi, um, I'm Charlie. Uh, I'm Charlie Dale. I use he, him pronouns. Um, I'm so overwhelmed by the amazing talent that I've been surrounded with today and all of the amazing words that everyone has spoken. Um, I'm deeply grateful to be here with all of you. Um, I'm just going to take a deep breath. If you would love to take a deep breath with me, I think that would be really helpful for all of us. <laughs> Thank you. I have a couple poems for you all. Um, I'm gonna start with one that I wrote last week. Um, and it is about watermelon. And it is based off of an exercise that Tara had us do in our class. Um, so shout out to Tara. Um, cool. I like that you are mostly water. I can impress the boys and eat a whole half of you by myself. And when I say impress the boys, I mean impress the boy in me. I remember a friend I liked. Their favorite fruit was watermelon. I tasted more watermelon with them than I ever did their lips because the struggle with watermelon is that you can't eat the rind. When you're green with envy of the other boy you liked, you don't realize you wish she liked you like he liked you, for he was a boy like you. And that is all watermelon has to say. <laughs> Thank you. Um, next, we have a poem called Peeing is the Apocalypse. Um, and this goes out to all of my fellow trans folks um, where every day is a struggle to use the bathroom um, and usually multiple times a day because we pee multiple times a day. <laughs> Peeing is the apocalypse. While you live on planet, peeing is a walk in the park. I live on planet, peeing is the apocalypse. While you live on planet, peeing is a walk in the park. I live on planet, I know where every bathroom is on every floor of my college campus. While you live on planet, peeing is a walk in the park. I live on planet, I'm checking what dick I'm wearing before every sip of water. While you live on planet, peeing is a walk in the park. I live on planet, how long do I have to be in here? Uh, do they think I'm a guy? Do they think I'm a girl? Are they judging me? While you live on planet, peeing is a walk in the park. I live on planet, why did I wear this shirt? Am I binding? Why do I wear these pants? There's gonna be a full moon. Why did I wear this dick? I can't even stand to pee in a urinal. While you live on planet, peeing is a walk in the park. I live on planet, I'm waiting 15 minutes in San Jose International Airport telling the fourth dude to go ahead and use the urinal. I'm waiting for a stall. While you live on planet, peeing is a walk in the park, I second guess everything. Do I dare risk the taunting knob of the gender neutral bathroom stall only to be mocked when it's surely being used and locked? Mocked by the woman's icon on the adjacent restroom door, a restroom I used to use with ease, well, more like repulsive confusion, but at least I knew I passed the test. Played woman so well, I knew it was safe. See, while you lived on planet, peeing is a walk in the park. I lived on planet, every ounce of this skin feels wrong. Do I dare risk the impending doom of only one escape route collapsing, my world falling into catastrophic defeat? Or do I choose another bathroom, a multi-stall? Gender neutral or men's, gender neutral or men's, ironically, this choice is a good description of my coming out story. Gender neutral, providing safety, men's affirmation, the pressure of it all. While you live on planet, peeing is a walk in the park. I live on planet, peeing is the apocalypse. 
As I walk into the men's room, I ask myself, am I prepared? Urinal or toilet, am I prepared? Noises on human coming from the stall, am I prepared? Men face to face walking way too close to each other, am I prepared? Peeing or shitting way too loudly, am I prepared? For guttural moans and gassy atomic bombs, am I prepared? For YouTube videos coming from adjacent stalls, am I prepared? For the bathroom war zone, never a peaceful place to call my own. And even when I have the right dick and shoes a urinal, do I risk standing up, leaking, maybe peeing all over myself? All for the ecstasy of going to the bathroom the way my brain thinks I should. Do I risk or do I risk the stall? Sit surrounded by piss and probably shit stained walls, wondering if they all notice. I'm peeing sitting down. Am I prepared? Do cis men pee and shit at the same time? If I do, is that a giveaway? Give way to everything I think I know, everything you need me to be, just so I can sit down, rest, and pee. This is called Moths and Goo. Um, also, testosterone is a form of hormone replacement therapy, and I took it in the form of gel, which some people don't know exists, so I just want to throw that out there. It does. Needles is not the only option. If you're struggling with that, reach out to me. I'll talk to you. Um, yeah. Moths and goo. Clouds descend. Hopeless moths swarming into blinding light poison my fatal attraction. Fearful of my own skin falling, ripping away. Layer gel on my body, goo builds and destroys my cocoon. Breaking free, all to swarm this fatal light. Breaking out isn't linear. There's, not, there's something scary about free falling. No control. Don't know how my face will look. Don't know how much weight I'll gain. Don't know what man I'll be. Where are the role models? Where are the role models? There are no good men, free fall. Abusers are men, free fall. I leave behind good women, free fall. I become men, wings out, because they must come out. Every moment falling in, every moment fading out. I don't wanna become as I come undone. When will the changes stop? Patience as I gain 60 pounds. Patience as my face hollows and fattens one more time. Patience as I learn how to breathe in new eyes, new lungs, new wings. Oh look, how glorious the spots. Changes happening fast pairs with changes happening not fast enough. Not fast enough. Never enough. Not drastic enough. I look out to the eyes of my wings distracted by the spots. Second eyes don't see the same. Flailing, I fall. Fighting, I open. Never enough, but more, I become familiar. The patterns of my wings recognizable. There will always be another chrysalis, another opening, another wingspan. I will never stop breathing. Okay, we're skipping one of them because I don't have enough time. <laughs> this is called drowning versus swimming. An abnormal reaction to an abnormal situation is normal. Victor Frankl. What does it feel like? They want me to say I've always known. But I ask you, do you ever know how you've abandoned yourself to become? Do you ever really know when everything's going to change? So I tell you, I never really knew. What does it feel like? It feels like being underwater, drowning, a dream you can't wake up from. You don't know which way is up except for to say that maybe, maybe it's this way. You follow because you can't breathe. How much of a choice is it between drowning and swimming? 
swimming towards the surface, hoping it's the surface when you've never seen the surface before. Living a dream when it's the only thing you know is terrifying. Sometimes you question dying. You think it'd be easier than swimming aimlessly. The moments when it feels like you're swimming down deeper when all you want is up, a place you'd imagine would taste, smell, be different. Air might flow easily, breath might be exchanged more effortlessly with the world out there. So is it a choice? Do you dare say it's a choice? I swear it's not a fucking choice. I don't have a choice and I do. See, I didn't die. I refuse to keep drowning. I choose to take one step forward, one day at a time. I choose to grow, to change. Trust me, it surprises you and me both that needles in my belly and surgeons in Florida feel just as easy as one more deep dive. I'm swimming up, a walk in the park somehow, somehow. Just another breath, just another step. I take the next one. By the time I arrive, I am ready. I am ready. This is my normal. Somehow. A change is only a change in hindsight. In process, change is just life. Brain the same, sex changed, now it's my life. And I know how to breathe again. Thank you so much. That was wonderful. Thank you so much. I really enjoyed that. Thank you, Charlie, and thanks for everyone from our hour two of our epic Poetry Pride Parade. It continues on into hour three. I'm going to mute all our beloveds here in the Zoom room, and we're going to take a break. Please feel free to put your screens on um, your 